Father Lampert, how are you today? I'm doing very well, Kevin. It's good to be with you. Good to be here. Good to have you. Um, can we start with a blessing? Absolutely. It's Holy Week, and it's always a, a good time for an extra blessing, because I think Amen. the evil one may try to up his game, so to speak, during this holy time of year. So let's say a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And loving God, we ask your blessing upon us, upon our conversation, and we pray that what we do here today will help bring people closer to you. And we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name Amen. of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, so we are, I have a ton of questions for you. <laughs> I uh, just finished the book. It's, uh, it's wonderful. And I particularly love the framing of exorcism as an, ac as a, an activity, a rite of, of light, of redemption, um, along with reconciliation. Um, but something that's um, Hollywood has kind of taken over as this dark, ugly, evil thing. And there is an aspect to that. But why is it so important to remember the aspect of the light and the redemption? I think one of the unique things about Christianity is that it's not about our search for God, but it's about God's search for us. So anytime the human person is lost, God always takes the first step. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden after they had sinned. God moves to the garden and says to Adam, where are you? Now, God knew where he was, but he's basically trying to shine a light on the sin that Adam and Eve had just committed and to give them an opportunity to repent. And for me, the ministry of exorcism is one of the tools that God provides the church to help people realize that God is looking for them, even though they may feel as if they're trapped in the world of the darkness that comes from the evil one. And that's uh, sort of in line with a lot of what, because I one of the first people I talked to before this interview was my parish priest. And um, he's, you know, he kind of went like this and said, you know, they, they exorcists deal with a lot. It's exhausting. You describe that in the book. Uh, like the, the evil one especially targets you. What is, what is that experience like then? What do you do to overcome it? The devil certainly knows those who are working to defeat him. Certainly parish priests are on the front line of that. And then exorcists in the unique role that they play in the life of the church can also be up against really extra attacks by the devil. Because again, he knows that exorcists are working to defeat his plan to bring people into the light of Christ. So he will try to trip us up. You know, the devil may send people my way who don't really want help but they're there to chew up my time so that people who truly need help aren't getting it. The devil may uh, try to distract me. You know, in addition to this ministry, I'm also the pastor of two parishes here in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, so I can also be caught up in dealing with normal parish, everyday activities, and the devil may try to trip me up in that type of ministry as well. So again, the devil is very clever. He is a trickster. He knows those who are working to defeat him, and he will try his best to uh, try to thwart the plan of God, if you will. Yeah, I uh, Kierkegaard, the philosopher, talks about the connection between busyness and worldliness. And one of the ways uh, that, that Satan gets to us is by keeping us busy. Yeah, you know, and that's a challenge for, I think, priests today, because... There are fewer priests today, so priests wear many different hats, take on more responsibilities. We see many dioceses across the country that are merging and clustering parishes, and priests are taking on more responsibility. I tell people, I, I think I live in my car at times, driving huh. back from one parish to the other and, you know, traveling around for exorcism ministry. But I'm reminded in 2013, on Holy Thursday, at the Chrismas, when Pope Francis reminded the priests that we need to be about unction and not about function, mm -hmm. to really be focused on anointing people with the gladness of Jesus Christ and not just to see priesthood as a 
occup occupation as opposed to a vocation. So at least for me, being a parish priest now, it'll be 33 years coming up on June the 1st. Oh, and nice. And being the exorcist gives me a good balance in rediscovering priesthood as a vocation. Because I do think it, it's a challenge for many priests today, not just to get caught up in the busyness, that we lose the sense of vocation and begin to focus more on occupation. And for me, the word vocation means a calling from God. We do what we do because God has called us to do it. And if we truly believe that, then God will equip us with what we need in order to get the job done. Amen. Um, so unction versus function, I like that. Unction meaning getting out, doing it, getting being active in it instead of a sort of strict way of looking at it? Yeah, I think of unction, you know, you think of oil, you know, there's okay. that sense of unction. It's being with people, ministering to them. I have a good priest friend. Every time somebody says to him, Father, I know you're busy, he interrupts him and says, yes, I'm busy talking to you. How can oh. I help you? So again, we need to make sure people know that they're not a burden, but they're truly a blessing. And I think that's where the word unction comes from. You know, someone may come to the parish priest, and they may not know how to handle what they're dealing with, especially if it's of a demonic nature, but they can certainly listen to them, recognize that the person is suffering, do what they can, and then help guide and direct them maybe to some more specialized care that they can receive from within the church. I like that framing, and you dive into that in the book, the difference between, you know, your parish priest is more of sort of like your general practitioner, whereas the, an exorcist is like a, kind of like a heart surgeon or something. Yeah, it's um, more specialized. And even if one comes to see me for a specialized ministry, they still need to go back to their parish priest for that ongoing pastoral care. Because it's with, in the local parish that the person is going to experience the sacramental life of the church to be able to go to confession, receive the Holy Eucharist, maybe to be anointed if that's needed. But again, that parish priest is really going to be on the front lines of providing people with that unction that they need in order to realize that God is looking for them in the midst of the darkness where they feel trapped. So this gets to the the function of the the rite of exorcism, which is essentially to bring um, people back into the the fold of God's arms. Right? Is that an accurate description or no? It is, and I think kind of playing on some of our terminology. You know, one of my favorite lines in the Bible is in the book of Genesis, when God says, "Let there be light." And in the ministry of exorcism, I think it's turning the light of Christ on in the life of people who are trapped in Satan's darkness and allowing them to experience the freedom that God wants all of his children to have. You know, I always say to people that the devil's like a cockroach. And if you go into a room where the light's off and you flip a light on and there's bugs in the room, they're going to scurry for every crack and crevice that they can find. And when the church in the ministry of exorcism turns the light of Christ on, in the lives of these people who have been deceived by the evil one, then the devil, like a cockroach, is going to scurry back into the darkness. So has there been, uh, you talked about this kind of a rise in um, ex exorcisms or, or crises related to it, and um, an, and the number of exorcists as well in the, the uh, two decades that you've been an exorcist. What's led to that uh, increase? So I was appointed back in 2005. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis has always had a priest in this role. Even when it fell out of practice in many dioceses across the country, Indianapolis has always had an exorcist. Ironically, the priest before me was the pastor of the parish where I attended grade school. So never dream that one day I was going to inherit his job. But he passed away back in 2005. All the priests knew the bishop was looking for a replacement. We were trying to stay under the radar. And uh, somehow I surfaced on the radar. 
he uh, appointed me. Again, I was about one of 12 appointed exorcists in the United States back in 05. Now that number has grown to well over 200. You know, I trained in Rome because the church says the best way to learn the ministry is through the apprenticeship model. But there really wasn't anyone to, you know, do that study with here in the States. So I was able to go to Rome, find a priest there who allowed me to uh, sit in on 40 exorcisms that he performed in the three months that I lived in Rome. And that allowed me to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who were up against the forces of evil and who were seeking the help of the church. And there is an exorcist training school in the United States now for priests and the people who work for them. And that's where many of the new exorcists are being trained right here in uh, the States. I also like that you, uh, as a child, you didn't say, when I grow up, I want to be an exorcist. And when, when you were well, a priest, you didn't say it either. You, um, tell us about kind of how you were, you were selected. Yeah, when I was a kid, I never thought I was going to do this. But I will tell you that I have eight brothers and sisters. And when we were kids, we never had dogs. We always had cats. And there was one cat we had. It was an all-black cat. And can you guess what we named that cat? Lucifer. What? Lucifer was the cat's name. So. <laughs> God has a great sense of humor. But, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Archbishop Daniel Beekline appointed me. He said he wanted a priest who believed in the reality of evil, but not one who would be too quick to believe that everyone who came to me, who believed that they were dealing with the demonic, that that would actually be the case. So really, I would agree when someone contacts me, they're suffering. Beyond a doubt, mm -hmm. I know they're suffering. But then the question is, is that suffering due to spiritual, physical, or mental causes, and then trying to get to the root cause of what they're experiencing? Archbishop Beekline, ironically, was the rector of St. Meinrad College in southern Indiana, where I went to school. So he knew me, and I think because we knew one another, and he saw my development during the seminary days, that he believed that I would be a good candidate for this position within the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And um, you also described your, the last conversation you had with him. What, what was that like? <laughs> yes, he, he passed away uh, a number of years ago. May he rest in peace. But uh, he was diagnosed with cancer, and I went to see him. He was kind of uh, meeting with all the priests one final time, and, and I was sitting there talking with him, and him and I used to joke back and forth over the years, like I would say to him, Archbishop, I found one of the younger priests who wants to be the exorcist. And he would say, I worry about anybody who would want the job. He goes, the fact that you didn't want it is why you get to keep it. And then I would say to him, well, I really want it. He goes, no, nope, you're not going to try to play on me. <laughs> he goes, and then when he was, uh, after he had resigned, I asked him, I said, now, does my appointment go away? You know, like when the bishop leaves? like the vicar general loses his authority and all of that. He said, oh, no, yours is a pastor appointment. It will go on and on and on yeah. and on and on. <laughs> and then he took my hand and he said, will you ever forgive me for what I've done to you? And then we <laughs> both had a good laugh. And then I've since been reappointed by the two other bishops that, uh, that I've had since his passing away. That's what, what a uh, beautiful way to part ways. Uh, for now, you know. Yeah, because um, yeah, the bishop, I was going to say, the bishop is the exorcist. It's based on chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel, where Jesus sends the 12 out and he gives them authority over all unclean spirits. So as Catholics, we recognize that the bishops are the successors to the apostles, so they have the authority to cast out demons. And then the local bishop, at his discretion, may appoint one or more of his priests to do this ministry in his name. And I think that's good to point out because I'm not appointed an exorcist for the Universal Church. I'm mm -hmm. only appointed for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis because the authority is with my bishop and I'm and he's bestowed that charism or authority on me to do this ministry in his name. So I can only function within the Archdiocese of Indianapolis unless another bishop gives me the authority to operate in his diocese. 
So that that was one of the that's one of the many things I learned reading this, and you lay it out very very cleanly, very um, directly. Um, you just mentioned charism. Um, can you give just a slight little uh, description of what that is for somebody who's not familiar with that term? So a charism would be kind of one of the responsibilities that a bishop has within his diocese for the local church, and that would be to deal with people who believe that they're dealing with the extraordinary activity of the devil. And the church says there are four different types of that. It can be demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location associated with an object or even an animal. There can be demonic vexation, which are physical attacks, demonic obsession, which are mental attacks, and then demonic possession itself. So the exorcist should deal with extraordinary demonic activity. The parish priest should deal with the ordinary activity of the devil. And I think there's a four-stage plan of attack that the devil uses in all of our lives. At its basic root, it's temptation. The devil uses deception. He gets us to buy into lies. The deception leads to division. We find ourselves broken. That division will lead to diversion. We try to look for a substitute for God that will help with the pieces of our lives together. But ultimately, nothing can take the place of God. And then that diversion ends in discouragement. People kind of lose a sense of meaning, purpose, and direction in life. And when people arrive at discouragement, they have a choice to make. One pathway leads to death. Always spiritual, the complete rejection of God. Think of the growing number of atheists in the world today. Anymore. Sometimes death is physical. The, the rise in uh, suicides that we see in society today. But again, we're Christians. Hope is at the core of our beliefs. The other pathway leads to discipleship. People have a reawakening of the fact that they need God in their life. And then they kind of turn back to him. And I think that's where people can find that help in reawakening at the parish level. You know, I always say as one as a Catholic, there are five things that we can do to keep the devil on the run. We can go to Mass, we pray, we read the Bible, we celebrate the sacramental life of the Church, and we know and live out our faith. If we're doing those things, the devil has nothing to fear whatsoever. And we can find the strength that we need to live out our Catholic identity through our local Catholic parish. Have you read um, uh, René Girard, the theologian? Yeah, I read. Catholic. I read so much, so yeah, I, I'm usually I reading three or four books at a time. I I, I figured he he goes into the idea of of scapegoating mm -hmm. and uh, expulsion, and he uh, and I've always wanted to run this by um, somebody who knows the answer. Um, he talks about how Satan's greatest power, his magic, is uh, that he can expel himself. Um, to the point of causing scapegoats, so he ex he um, pos he takes possession of someone of something, and R Gerard talks about this on like a social level. So like a community becomes possessed by um, uh, Satan's evil, and um, he uses them and evacuates. Uh, after the disorder has settled, um, is that is it somewhat like that? I, I'm I'm interested by uh, the idea of like discouragement being sort of the the edge before launching into either death or discipleship. Mm -hmm. I I think that's a fascinating way to look at it. There's a couple of thoughts that come to mind. The first one is, you know, the devil can propose, but he cannot impose. Huh. He can propose that we do something but he can't force us to do it because we have free will. So again, think of Eve in the garden again in the conversation with the serpent. You know, the serpent doesn't take the forbidden fruit and cram it down her throat. He gets her to make the choice, and he presents the evil as something good. You look at society today in which we live, the devil may not be the cause of all of our problems, but he is an opportunist. And he can insert himself anywhere if he thinks it's going to 
promote his agenda. So think of people always ask me, for example, like COVID-19, did the devil cause that? And the answer is, I don't know, but I think the devil took advantage of that situation to lead people into isolation and even more polarization. So he kind of pits us up against one another and then kind of draws back like you just suggested and then just sees how humanity, we go after each other and, and tear each other apart. And I think we see a lot of that being played out in the world today. Again, just a lot of division, anger, bitterness, resentment, polarization. You know, the devil is all about divide and conquer, where Jesus teaches us that there's strength in numbers. You know, when he sent the disciples out, he sent them out in pairs. You think of the word church means community. And there is strength in numbers. So that's where humanity is stronger when we are in communion with one another. I think that's why the church in the United States is even celebrating the Eucharistic revival. It's yeah. about getting people to truly appreciate the Eucharist and how it brings us together by receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And it helps us to recognize that we, in a certain sense, are the body of Christ as well. Again, that sense of cohesion, being together, where the devil, again, is trying to shatter and break apart. You know, one of the best images I share with people about the devil and brokenness was uh, two young men that I went to see a number of years ago. And the one told me that he believed his brother was possessed because he was worshiping Satan. And when I went into their apartment, the brother who was worshiping Satan looked at me and the demon shrieked and the, the man ran down to his bedroom and slammed the door closed. The other brother and I went down there and we got the door open. And when the door opened, what I saw still stands out in my mind. There's The man is laying on the floor and there are no pictures on the wall. There's no furniture in the room. There are no curtains on the window. There is just broken glass covering the entire floor of this room. And this man is laying on top of the broken glass, chanting words of praise to Satan with an altar to Satan, which is the only item that he has in this entire room. But that broken glass all over the floor is just a very vivid reminder of how the devil is all about breaking and shattering our lives. Jesus wants us to help put the pieces together, but the devil is always there to divide and break. That is horrific imagery. Um, I mean, when, when you walk into the, these um, situations, how, um, how are you able to differentiate mental health a crisis from a demonic possession? You know, those situations, I mean, firsthand experience, yeah. Obviously, there's something demonic going on there. <laughs> I'm trained to be a skeptic, as are all exorcists. So I should be the last one to believe that somebody is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. The church does require someone to have some type of a psychiatric evaluation. So by a psychiatrist, a psychologist, basically asking, is there something about this person's condition that you can't explain? And they also need to have a physical examination by their family doctor just to rule out that, you know, they're not on some drugs or they're not mm -hmm. experiencing some physical malady that needs to be addressed. Because some of the signs that we see in people who are possessed can also be seen in people who are dealing with mental health issues. And oftentimes when people will say, well, Father, you want me to have a psychiatric evaluation because you don't believe me. But it's also true that if somebody is dealing with the demonic, they need to be in a good place mentally. And even by seeing the psychiatrist, that's going to help them in the long run if it's deemed necessary to go through the rite of exorcism. So I always believe that the priest, the psychiatrist, and the doctor should be working together, looking at a person's situation again, spiritually mentally and physically, and then giving the person the true help that they need. And sometimes there's an overlap. It's not always 100% yeah. psychiatric, 100% demonic. Maybe the two are going on at the same time. And I'm not a trained psychiatrist, so I do want to rely on 
experts in that field to help me help the person who is suffering. I love that about the church. Uh, through the, throughout its entire history, we see that this uh, it's not a like you know hammer doctrine like this is this is it it's like no we'll, we'll consider things mental health does factor into this a person's biology does factor into it but you know there are things that just can't be explained at all um is this what what is behind this rise in exorcisms I think the reason we see an increase in demand is because faith is in decline. Faith in God will lead us in one direction, a lack of faith in another. You look at the growing number of people today who grew up in traditional Christian homes who now identify as being an atheist or who just simply no longer practice their faith. They're kind of indifferent to God, if you will. And I don't believe the devil is up to his game. I just think that more people today are willing to play the devil's game because they don't have that relationship with God. I think a lot of people today believe that, you know, faith, religion is all about rules and regulations. They don't realize that it's really about a relationship. And one is yeah. either in a relationship with God or they're in a relationship with something else. And I would suggest that that's something else is none other than the devil himself. In various uh, guises. Uh, uh, that's, and I like, you, you kind of walk through some of those guises as warning signs, you know, uh, even something so, like, seemingly um, innocuous or socially acceptable as yoga can have an element of, spiritual invasion to it mm -hmm. well what are some of the other things that people should look out for or be aware of and how do they know uh this is not the right i don't need to be here i need to step away and, and what should they do at that point i think it's about really just knowing our catholic faith and not association associating with things that are contrary to that faith so you mentioned like yoga for example there's, obviously there's nothing wrong with exercising yeah. But the danger would be, does one get caught up in the spirituality that's tied in with yoga that's not a part of our Christian heritage? So you look at the world of the occult, whether it's going to see a psychic or a medium, the use of pendulums and crystals, magic and casting spells, sorcery, all of that type of thing. That's all contrary to our Catholic identity. You know, there is a power behind the world of the occult, but the power behind it is the devil himself. And so he uses these tricks, if you will, to lead people into a world of deception. You know, many of us don't realize that we're caught up in a superstitious world, whether people mm -hmm. are reading their horoscopes, they're knocking on wood, they have the rabbit's foot, you know, the, the four-leaf clover, whatever it might be. And again, Many people may look at this and say, it's all just kind of harmless fun. But again, are we really putting too much credence in those things rather than in our own relationship with God? And whenever I go around and if I'm invited to speak at a parish or whatnot, I usually tell people, rather than critiquing a lot of other things, I just really challenge people to root out of their lives anything that is not a part of our Christian faith. You know, the Catholic Church has a great treasure trove of wonderful spiritual gifts. We don't have to be turning to the world of the occult as if somehow there's something deficient in what the Church is providing. Now, even with that said, I've seen a growing trend in recent years because faith is in decline. Many people view the exorcist as a magician, that somehow I have a bag of tricks and I can use my cross, the crucifix, holy water, and I can make the demons go away. I've had many people even tell me, Father, just make the devil, the demons go away, but I want nothing to do with God. Now, well, people relying on me, we're all in trouble. Please. You know, because again, Jesus is not a bystander. He's the main actor. Yeah. And the priest is acting in the person of Christ in helping one be delivered from the attacks of the evil one. 
So just helping people realize that faith is at the core of helping people who are dealing with the extraordinary demonic activity. Because I would even suggest that casting the devil out is the easy thing to do. The mm. harder thing is to convince the person to invite God in. I had a young man one time who told me that he goes, my girlfriend was possessed and I did what I was supposed to do to get rid of it, the demon, but it didn't work. I said, well, what were you supposed to do? He said, well, I went down to the local New Age bookstore and I bought an exorcism kit. And he goes, I've been burning sage in the house because I am told that demons hate the smell of sage and that would make them flee. Kind of based on the book of Tobit and the demon Asmodeus where they're burning, you know, something to, and the smell is going to make the demon leave. And I said to him, now are you listening to what you're saying? I go, your faith is in sage where your faith needs to be in Christ. Because even mm. the things the church uses in an exorcism aren't means in and of themselves. They always point to something greater. You think of the holy water. It points to our baptism into Christ, whereby we have put on Christ. You think of the crucifix. You know, the moment the devil believes that he has won, Jesus is dying on the cross. The moment of his perceived victory is actually the moment of his defeat. And when mm -hmm. the priest shows the demon the crucifix, he's basically saying, you have been defeated before, you will be defeated again. Do not resist the power and the authority of Christ. Wow. I, I love that way of uh, describing it, that where Christ is in the, in the seat. Christ is, it's, you, Christ is, um, is, is it accurate to call you kind of like a mediator or, or you're, you're there? Yeah, because that's, yeah. okay. again, that's exactly right. Christ is the main actor. You know, the Latin phrase, the church says that the priest acts in persona Christi. It's oh, yeah. not what like confession. I'm doing, but it's what Christ is doing in and through these ministers who have been called to the sacrament of holy orders, the vocation of the priesthood. That's what I, I wish a lot of Protestants understood about confession and um, on reconciliation. It's not us, um, you know, confessing to our parish priest, which it's, it's good to have those conversations and to, to have a, a, a familial relationship with your parish priest. But it, it's um, we're we're having this lucky beautiful moment with Christ himself and we're we're getting the this gift of redemption um, father gabriel father gabriel amor the former chief exorcist in rome very popular there's several books that he's written he passed away in 2016 i had the opportunity to meet him in rome back in 2012 but he always said that the very first place to begin with anyone who believes they're up against the devil is for that person to go to confession. Hmm. He said a good confession is better than a hundred exorcisms. And wow. the reason is when we confess our sins, we place them in the hands of God. And once we place them in the hands of God, the devil can no longer use them against us. You know, this name Satan means accuser. So he proposes that we do something. We submit to that temptation. We give in to sin. And then there's the devil who puts us on a guilt trip right away. Like, ha, look at you, look at what you did. You think you're so holy and you go to church and all this. And then guilt is one of the ways I think the devil gets a foothold in our lives. So when we go to confession, I think we slam the door on the devil's foot. And then he's going to pull it yeah. away and go, ow, if you will. And then that allows us to be reconciled to God. Yeah, I, um, I was... I went to confession before this. I went before noon mass today. I wanted to make sure everything I was, you know, this is an, a special one. Um, so one of the, one of the parables that has always sort of uh, haunted me is uh, the house of spirits parable in Matthew 12 um, with the, the, the demons are exercised or a demon's exercised and seven more come back into the mm -hmm. clean house. What, what does that mean? That's where the demon is cast out, but the person doesn't invite God in. So okay. it says that once the demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders to the arid wasteland, and then coming back and finding the house swept clean, meaning 
it's gone, that God hasn't been invited in. Then he goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself, and they come and take up residence in the person. And that goes okay. back to what I was trying to allude to earlier, that it's not enough just to cast a demon out. God has to be invited in. And if God is not invited in, then their situation can be seven times worse than it was before. You know, God desires that we return to him. But again, we have to make that choice. In the book of Revelation, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He yeah. doesn't kick the door in and say, here I am to save the day. He's knocking, but we have to accept the invitation and let him in. And when we don't let him in, then the devil's very happy to try to fill that void in our lives. So today is Spy Wednesday. Um, this is uh, yeah, that's this is an easy transition to make because I can't think of a a person in human history who was more possessed than Judas. Yeah, you think about it because Jesus begins his public ministry. He's baptized in the River Jordan. The Spirit descends upon him. He's driven into the desert. And who does he encounter? The devil. And I would even suggest, if you recall, when Adam and Eve had sinned, they were cast out into the wilderness, into the desert. Hmm. And God did that, I think, as an act of mercy. Because if Adam and Eve had approached the tree of life in a state of original sin, then there would have been no hope for redemption. So God sends them out, but then immediately begins a plan to go and search for lost humanity. So Jesus is baptized. He goes into the desert to begin his public ministry, to look for lost humanity, but he has to contend with the one who caused the, the fall of humanity, namely the devil. And at the end of the temptation, it says that the devil left him for a period. And when did the, when did the devil return? When he entered into Judas, when he yeah. then betrayed him. You know, I love the analogy. You think of the good shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes in search of the lost one. St. Yeah. Augustine says, that the 99 refers to the nine choirs of angels. God leaves heaven and goes in search of the lost tenth choir, namely humanity, to restore humanity to its rightful place. That's beautiful. That's, and you can, feel, you can feel the light in a statement like that. Um, speaking of light, uh, one of, I'm a convert. I, I converted from, I was a Baptist. and. Uh, along with confession, the two things that really s proved to me that I, I'm Catholic and I think it's the right thing are um, the role of Mary and the rosary. Um, what role does Mary play in uh, exorcism? I will say this first. My mother was a convert, too. But she oh, always nice. said that she was not a convert. She was always Catholic. She just didn't know it. And then when yep, she found that's out, she said, when she discovered what Catholics believe, it's not like she had to accept something that was alien to her. It was kind of like, ah, this is the right fit. It's like trying on clothes or something. You're like, this is the right fit. And that's always Spot the mentality on. that she had. Because she always said converting means like you were like nothing and then you became something. But again, her analogy was, I always was. I just didn't know it. And then when I, I knew it, that. I said, that's who I am. So you think of the Blessed Mother, you know, you think of the devil. If I were to ask you, what's the main sin of the devil? You would say pride. Pride. And what's the, what is the virtue that cancels out the vice of pride? It's humility. humility. And what's the best example of humility that we have? Our Blessed Mother. Yeah. So you think of God says to Eve, do certain things. She says, no. The archangel Gabriel comes from God to Mary and says, this is God's plan for you. And what does Mary say? She says, yes. Yeah. So Catholics, we honor our Blessed Mother because she's the greatest example of humility. And she always teaches us that her yes to God needs to be our same response to God as well. You know, the devil, in addition to the sin of pride, many of the fathers of the church say that the angels were able to see God's plan for humanity, that God would take on human form, yeah. and the devil couldn't accept that. Lucifer wanted 
God to join with his nature, not with human nature. Because mm-hmm. demons even mock exorcists. You know, they'll call us dumb lumps of clay, stupid monkeys. Who are you to tell me what to do? They can't accept the fact that they're being commanded to do something by a creature that they consider to be inferior to themselves. So think about the incarnation. God takes on human form. So humanity rises above the angels. And then you think of our Blessed Mother, she becomes the Queen of Heaven. Yeah. So again, she is also elevated. And Lucifer couldn't rejoice in God's plan because rather than seeing things according to God's view, he only could see them according to his view. And the belief is that Lucifer was a seraphim angel closest to the throne of God. Seraphim means the fiery ones. Literally, he's on fire with the glory of God, which is why Mm. the name Lucifer even means light bearer. Mm. So he would radiate the the light of God more than any other creature. But then, obviously, through the incarnation, we have the unique role of Christ, the unique role of our Blessed Mother. So human nature is elevated higher than angelic nature, and that's something that the devil could not accept. So is that why the line in Luke, I saw Satan fall like lightning, is that sort of what it means? Like that? Absolutely, yep. His fall from from light into the disorder of a, a fallen kingdom, or yeah, and you think about lightning, you just see it for a brief second and then it's burned out. Yeah, and there there's Lucifer. He's he's burned out, if you will, because he's fallen from heaven. And here's a good analogy: I have six brothers, two sisters. My brothers and I, when we were younger, we used to love to play with these little rubber balls that glowed in the dark. So we would go into a room, and we would put them up against the light bulb, and then we'd turn all the lights off, make sure all the windows are closed, and then that rubber ball would glow. But eventually that glow would begin to fade if it was no longer fed from the light. And that's the same way with Lucifer. When he fell like lightning, his light burned out. He was no longer, you know, radiating the glory of God, and so that's why he's associated with darkness. We can say that his light has gone out. And that's what he wants us as well. He wants humans to join him in his rebellion against God so that our light will go out as well. That image of light is just so profound for me in the ministry of exorcism, because one of the things that I've learned in the ministry of exorcism to look for, to know that a demon has truly been cast out, and I've seen this on numerous occasions, is that the one who was possessed, once the demon is cast out, there's a glow about the person. And the best way I can describe the glow is think of a halo around the painting of a saint or a stained glass window. They're not radiating their glory. They're radiating the glory of God. And when a demon is truly cast out, they're again falling like lightning. Then that person literally has a divine glow about them. That's beautiful. I love that. That's, um, that must be a, I mean, you must be exhausted by that point. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Exhausted, physically, mentally, sweaty, and all of that. That's why people always say, well, Father, what do you do after an exorcism? And, you know, one of the first ones I did after I returned from Rome back in 2006, I always tell people that I go, I worked with somebody for a year. The demon was cast out. They're like, what did you do? Did you celebrate mass? Did you do a holy hour? I said, no, I was two hours away from my parish and I was worn out. So I went to Dairy Queen and I ordered a large chocolate shake for the ride home. Nice. Well done. (laughs) That's awesome. That's, that must've been a delicious chocolate shake. A well earned hot day here in Indiana. And when I walked in the Dairy Queen, it was, it was crowded. And I said to myself, if these people knew where I just came from, I would be like Moses parting the Red Sea because they couldn't get away from me fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so prayer, uh, we've, you've mentioned prayer a couple times. What role does it play? I mean, uh, um, is it right for me to say that a healthy prayer life can ward away any any need for um 
an exorcist. Like if you have a healthy prayer life, you're you're shored up with your spiritual spiritual armor. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think of prayer life. You know, I think of a rope. And a rope is made of many different strands. And I think every time that we pray, it creates another strand. And we bind all these together, and we have something pretty powerful. So every time we pray, we're strengthening our relationship with God. And if we have that strong relationship with God, you know, the devil may try to trip us up here and there. But again, the, the ordinary sacramental life of the church will deal with that. We don't really need to see an exorcist. You know, I. You know, the best plan for me would be for, for me to be out of business. Yeah. Yeah, that people wouldn't need the exorcist. Again, they would be able to deal with their parish priests and the sacramental life of the church and dealing with any tricks the devil may be trying to play in their lives. But again, faith is key, and certainly at the core of our faith is is prayer. But people need to know how to pray and why we pray. I think there's a lot of people out there who believe that prayer is something that we do to convince God to do something that God otherwise would not have done if we had not prayed. But prayer yeah. doesn't change God. Prayer changes us. Where we can pray and ask God for anything, but the key line is from the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, thy will be done. Yeah. Yes, I would like for things to be this way, yet not my will, but yours. We see that in the Passion reading, you know, that we had on Palm Sunday coming up on Good Friday. Again, we want things according to God's way, not ours. The devil always wanted things according to his way. But again, people who are rooted in prayer always want things to be done according to God's plan. That's so liberating. Um, your will, not my will, be done. It, it it frees us of this uh this weight that we kind of impose on ourselves, and Satan takes advantage of. Um, is that 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 glow that you described? Is that freedom? Is that what they're experiencing? Like God's gift of freedom, God's gift of freedom, God's unconditional love. Just that complete acceptance of whatever Peace. God wants for me, I embrace it. Because if you think about it, what's the one thing that we have that God does not have, but that God desires? And it's our free will. Mm. God wants the human person to unite our free will with his, and in doing so, discover freedom in the true sense of the word. Freedom doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want. You know, John Paul II would say that. When we think freedom means we can do whatever we want, we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. But when we realize that true freedom means to live in the manner that God created us to live, that's, that again, that's exactly true freedom. That's where we find a sense of peace, contentment, joy, radiating that goodness and glory of God. You also, in connection with freedom in the book, discuss individualism. Um, what is, what makes, uh, uh, this modern, uh, incarnation of it or this, um, modern idea, what makes it so threatening to spiritual life, to the life of the church and to the life of the community? Because instead of saying thy will be done, we say my will be done. Hmm. We want things the way that we want it to be done. And that's exactly how the devil, that's what Lucifer wanted. He didn't want God's plan. He wanted his plan. And that's played out every day in the lives of so many different people that walk this planet. We want things done according to our view rather than God's view. But if God is truly the creator of all that is, you know, what are the first 10 words in the Bible, in the book of Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What yeah. does that tell us about God? In the beginning, God created time. The heavens, God creates space. The earth, God creates matter. So God creates time, space, and matter, which means God is outside of time, space, and matter. Now, I can't yeah. wrap my brain around that. I can say that, but trying yeah. to, to really put that in a context that I can understand, you know, is beyond my ability. 
But again, our goal then is to unite ourselves with the one who truly is supernatural, who is above our understanding of nature, and that is only God himself. Because the goal of the Christian life would be to uh, one day to dwell in the indwelling of the persons of the Holy Trinity. Amen. To unite ourselves to God. And I think we get a foretaste of that every time we receive the Eucharist. Again, we're back yeah. to the sacramental life of the church. Yes, and again, undoubtedly. When, when people walk away from the church, when they walk away from the Eucharist, we're literally walking away from God. And we're putting that union with God in jeopardy. We may be uniting ourselves with this world, but what's going to happen to this world? It's going to collapse. It's and going crumble. to collapse. It's, going to, it's nothing. Only God is enduring, again, because God is outside of time, space, and matter. So that's the one that we should desire to unite ourselves to. What is the role of um, the guardian angel, our, our guardian angel? I always like to tell people that our guardian angel is more powerful than the devil himself. And usually people really need to let that soak in for a moment. Because if you think of the nine choirs of angels, the seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones, the powers, and the virtues, and the principalities, and the archangels and angels, do you think of those? So our guardian angels are in the ninth choir. But mm -hmm. Lucifer fell from the first choir. But a imperfect angel that fell from the first choir is inferior to a lower ranking angel from the ninth choir who chose to unite their free will with god and that's why again our guardian angel is more powerful than the devil himself in the scripture but the bible even tells us that you know we all have a guardian angel and they behold the face of our heavenly father so we should always realize that god never abandons us you know, that line in Scripture, where two or more are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. I remember during my seminary studies, and it, it's written on Oxyrhynchus papyrus number one. Now, that's a big fancy terminology, but what paper was used? Papyrus leaves. Hmm. And there was a line from this, it said, where two or more are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. But when there is one, he is not alone. And that last line is not in Scripture. But it is written on an old papyrus leaf, and that makes me think of our guardian angels, that even when we think we're alone, we're never truly alone. God is still with us by sending us our guardian angels. So I'll say that again, where two or more are gathered, there am I in the midst of, of them, but when there is one, he, she is not alone. I love that. I love that. I, I've been... Um... Um, the guardian angel prayer was the first prayer that I taught my daughter. She's, she's about to be four. Um, and it's really something I'm teaching her as like to, to comfort her, to, um, in, in during strive, strive for, to carry her. Uh, are, are there other little prayers or sayings or verses or anything that people can tell themselves in these moments when they have to, when they have to decide? Mm -hmm. I think that's where <clears throat> the power of Scripture comes from. You know, we, we need to know the Word of God. Because when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, he talked back to the devil using the Word of God. And the best way, I think, to talk back to the devil is by knowing the Word of God. So when the devil says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to turn to bread, Jesus is able, able to say, not by bread alone does man live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So I think it's important to memorize lines of Scripture. Most people can think of John 3.16, for example, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. I, one of my favorite prayers is the Jesus prayer. Lord yeah. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So the Gar Holy Guardian Angel prayer, if you think of the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary. We should all know certain prayers or passages of scripture that we can simply quote and pray whenever we feel as if we're under the attack by the evil one because again talking back to the devil not in our own words but in the the power of the word of god and in the power of prayer is very effective in breaking what the devil is trying to do to us but simply to remain 
speechless would cause us to give into fear. And once we're living in fear, the devil can pretty much have his way with us. So we have to get rid of that fear and develop the confidence. Think of Psalm 23. Even though I walk mm -hmm. through the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side with your rod and your staff to give me comfort. Again, there's a, a line that people can memorize. God never promised that we wouldn't experience darkness, but he did promise that we would never have to face it alone. But the devil would have us believe that we are alone. And when we are in that isolation, he believes he can have his way with us. So this is a uh, last question. Unfortunately, I have about 50 more. Um, <laughs> um, has technology worsened the demonic crisis? I think it has, you know, again, the devil as an opportunist can use whatever means that is out there to try to advance his kingdom. Technology is not inherently evil. But I think a lot of people use it in a very bad and evil way to try to promote what the devil wants to do to society. You look at people today, and I'm a people watcher, whether you see people in airports and restaurants, what are people always doing? They're always yeah. looking at their gadgets. We're in isolation. We're not in that sense of community. It's almost like we get the shakes if we have to put our, our phone down for even just a minute. And again, you look at a lot of the, the really bad stuff that's out there on the Internet, and I think the devil uses that as a way to continue to divide people. I mean, one of the greatest sins that's out there right now is, is pornography. I mean, mm -hmm. I hear that as a priest, people are trapped in that grip of pornography because it's just literally a click away. Yeah. And people always ask me, well, how do I overcome it? I will say, you know, being public in the ministry of exorcism, I have a lot of people who reach out to me that aren't dealing with the demonic, but they're, they're looking for spiritual guidance. Yeah. You know, there's a young lady in, in Australia who told me that she listened to an interview that I did, and she had no faith, but it motivated her to go down to the local Catholic parish, sign up for the RCIA, take instructions, and she's being received into the church this Amen. coming Saturday. There's a young man that I've been talking to in Sweden who lives on the Arctic Circle who said that he is, has this addiction to pornography, and he realizes that the only way to overcome it is God. But he doesn't know who God is or know how to tap into God because he's never been raised in any type of faith tradition. So just offering people like that, you know, some spiritual guidance and direction. You know, when people have an addictive you know, have an addiction to something, the only way they're going to overcome that is if they find something that's even more important that demands their time and attention. And ultimately, that needs to be God. And again, whether that's through our prayer life, our sacramental life, that's the way that we grow in our relationship with God. And the bigger God becomes in our lives, the smaller the devil come, becomes until he eventually just disappears and goes away i love that um is there anything else you want to add or any parting words for anyone always remember that god is more powerful than the devil we should never put god and the devil on the same playing field god is the creator god stands alone as father son and holy spirit the devil is the creature so let's not try to give him more power than, than is due. And ultimately, the devil was cast out of heaven, but he wasn't cast out of creation. God can still use the devil for his greater purposes. So if anyone believes they're dealing with demonic activity in their life, use that to your advantage. If the enemy has allowed you to see a weakness in your spiritual armor, you now know where you need to put in some more effort to grow in holiness and virtue and become the person that God truly wants you to be. Amen. Thank you, Father. Yes, God bless. It's good to be with you.